All right, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, uh, thanks uh, for having us. Uh, thanks, Bjorn, for introducing, and thanks, Tilo, and everyone for, I think, a pretty, pretty, pretty cool event. Uh, it's the second year in a row we, uh, or I have the chance to speak here, and it's it's very pleasing to see more and more industrial players involved. So, so great stuff going on. Um, Alias is a robot cybersecurity company. Uh, we essentially work with uh, manufacturers of robots and also users, and try to make sure that these technologies are used uh, securely. Uh, security has typically two facets: the offensive and the defensive one. Uh, let's start with the later. Um, so typically, when we think about security, and particularly within this context, we tend to isolate ourselves into the upper layers of this representation. This, this has in the middle the OSI stack, and how approximately, please be here with me, we can understand the different layers of ROS and ROS2. Now, according to statistics, most of these security attacks actually happen at layers uh, three and four. Um, does that mean we can just disregard that? Not, not really. Security is not really a product that you can just patch and that's it. Security is a process. You need to continuously over and over and over assess it. Um, we've heard and spoken with lots, lots of manufacturers and users over the past year or two years. Uh, um, and surprisingly, we heard quite a bit about, yes, we're using VPNs, so we can just relax about security, right? Well, here uh, I brought to you actually a CVE, which is a vulnerability identifier, which came up just a few days ago. This is a hole in VPNs, which applies actually across vendors, OpenVPN or other implementations. And it does apply to Linux and other operating systems. So this means that regardless of whether you deploy a VPN per robot or per series of robots or even per robot component, you're subject to be vulnerable. Once again, security is a process. What my team and I do is to get ourselves in the mind of an attacker. We try to provide security offensively. We don't provide the mitigations. We report about the vulnerabilities. Now, this is the pipeline of what we believe and are applying uh, happens when an attacker attacks potentially a robotic application. It goes from reconnaissance, which is a topic we covered at last Roscon. We gave uh, a speech at the security workshop, pretty much showing how uh, ROS2 was vulnerable to some reconnaissance attacks at that point, down to control. Because in robotics, we don't care just about exfiltration of data, as it happens in IT. We also care about losing control or having our robot controlled by a third party. That's likely the last scenario. Uh, today, we'd like to give a few bits about uh, cyber intrusion exploitation, and particularly, uh, we'd like to discuss a few points uh, that we've learned so far about vulnerabilities. Um, now, um, from a security perspective, we wanted to bring you some definitions. Uh, bugs are errors, failures in software. So typically, um, and most of those errors we see out there are, are back. Some of them are quality related, some of them are security related, and there are even others. Uh, the ones that have or might have security repercussions uh, typically are denominated as weaknesses. Now, if a weakness is exploitable, right, if a malicious actor or actress can directly use it for bad purposes, then it becomes a vulnerability. It elevates one degree. Vulnerabilities are in charge of most of the bad actions we see in industry, across industries, actually. Uh, but within vulnerabilities, we have a subset that's specifically worrying. And that's where we should probably dedicate short-term and also long-term, frankly speaking, most of our resources. And those are zero days. Vulnerabilities that haven't yet been patched or mitigated by those that should be interested, typically manufacturers. Of course, also end users, but it's up to the manufacturers to react. Alias Robotics motto is actually to remove zero days from robotics, and it's exactly because of the relevance of this aspect here. Now, we wanted to bring to you here some information that actually in the next slide you will see it's open and everyone can see it, about the data we have collected over specifically, this has been cooked uh, not so long ago, recently, about ROS, ROS2, and two vendors, UR, which is here today with us, uh, and ABB. So let's start with ROS, right? So, um, and you have two graphs here that compare very different things, yet correlated and interesting at the same time. We have days until mitigation, 
of a flaw, vulnerabilities in this case, and then we have the proportion of zero days, which one of these vulnerabilities have been patched and thereby are mitigated, and which, one of, uh, which, which proportion remains as a zero day. If we, look, if we look at ROS, we see that there are vulnerabilities that are longer or older in this case uh, than three years, and in a way that matches with what many of us believe, right, ROS1 was not thought for security. Yet we see there's been some patches, some security patches, and some vulnerabilities have been mitigated. If we look at ROS2, and we only take into account the days until mitigation, we say, well, uh, vulnerabilities are below the two-year uh, barrier, so it's doing better than, than ROS1, right? Well, no. All of those are actually zero days. Most of them, I must say, though, apply currently to the DDS layer and are pretty much related to aspects of the standard itself. The standard itself has flaws. We have discussed this with several vendors, and we are trying to work out a way to uh, somehow tackle this. If we go beyond ROS and ROS2 and look at some of the most popular and acknowledged manufacturers, we have UR, for example, which has vulnerabilities reported um, more than two years ago, getting close to uh, the third year, which remains still at zero days, and we have ABB. ABB uh, has some outliers up there, which indeed show there's a lot to do still in security, but you can see most of the vulnerabilities are actually concentrated within this line, which represents half a year. That clearly shows that they are doing something about security, that they are submitting and filing advisories, that they are dedicated resources. Uh, and anyone, which actually uh, all of you can do it, that Googles it around, you will see that ABB submits and files advisories very actively. As I pointed out, this data is actually online and available. We're constantly updating it, constantly. Uh, there's a lot of work to do, and we encourage everyone interested in security to help us do it. Um, we denominated Robot Vulnerability Database, and of course, this is a biased data set or archive uh, because we cannot really cover all of them. There's constantly new vulnerabilities applying to robotic technologies going on, uh, and also biased in the sense that not all of the vulnerabilities are here, first of all, because we don't disclose everything we find to try to be responsible with manufacturers first. Um, so in that sense, we're very open to contributions, but still this already uh, shows very interesting uh, aspects. We have a total of 102 vulnerabilities catalogued that apply to different robotic technologies. You can go to this repo and check it. Uh, with that data, um, and trying to remain uh, still very humble with this, this biased data, we plotted these two things which already show um, interesting uh, conclusions. Uh, Essentially, the first one is that there's no uh, security or security by obscurity doesn't work. If you try to hide into a corner and essentially ignore security, uh, it's going to be obvious based on data. And, and we can see it here in some of these cases. The second one is that investing, putting resources in security correlates directly uh, with the spread of its criticality. As you commit yourself to security, uh, involve yourself with more and more security teams in-house or outside of it, uh, you see how more and more uh, vulnerabilities of different criticality are, are being filed and mitigated. Um, and also, we can somehow conclude how, um, in a way, dedicating resources and budget into security correlates to the amount of vulnerabilities filed, which also correlates with the maturity of a product. Um, without getting into details of uh, where, uh, well, of how many, um, because we're still, as I said, processing uh, data, and, and there's many, many that will come into our list, we wanted to give you a sense of intuition of where exactly are we categorizing vulnerabilities for ROS and ROS2, and we are using here standards uh, that are widely spread in security, in particular, CWE, the Common Weakness Enumeration. Uh, and one thing, one observation we take from this is that the vulnerabilities that essentially appeared and appear, keep appearing in ROS are slightly different from the ones in ROS2. Um, and this, well, essentially relates uh, to the middleware that uh, sits uh, just below ROS2. Um, so, um, here we wanted to give you a sense of intuition of how we actually operate. And we are here proposing a scenario where essentially uh, there are two subjects of, of study, 
both of them using a UI robot, uh, with ROS2, uh, one of them using sros 2 which as most of you may know, is the secure ROS2 packages, right? And so we would expect that a malicious attacker with access to the local network where the worker is connecting would be able to perform reconnaissance on the robot that's, uh, that's essentially not protected and using a ROS2, but reality is different. We uh, filed actually about a week ago this uh, vulnerability which essentially uh, shows uh, how an attacker can perform reconnaissance and obtain information about the nodes in the network, even with sros 2 This is something we're currently looking at. So even ROS2 currently has issues. Uh, we've put lots of resources into trying to help, trying to reach mitigation as soon as possible. And for that, we have been creating something uh, kind of like a toolbox we call Allurity which allows us with simple YAML representations create subjects. So in this case, uh, this is the uh, YAML file for this particular scenario. Um, Allurity, again, our toolbox, which allows us to uh, help secure systems. Uh, it's based in Docker. We're trying not to reinvent the wheel. Every single module is a piece of software that abstracts uh, an element that's relevant for a robotics application. We have robot components, we have robots, and by robots we typically mean their file system image when visible or direct connectors to the real physical uh, mechanics of the robot. We have forensics tools, exploitation tools such as Metasploit or Robosploit, which we will hope to release very soon. Uh, testing tools for doing static and dynamic testing. Also we have fast testing elements which we are open sourcing very, very actively, reconnaissance elements. Uh, and of course, <clears throat> sorry, of course we are also um, making use of, of the great tooling that the ROS and the Gazebo community provide for our security assessments. Alority allows us to once again uh, prototype very quickly uh, because as, well, I guess most of us facing robotics know uh, system integration takes lots of time, so simplifying that aspect when it comes to security really speeds up assessments. So with really this YAML, we can launch and um, put together cook subjects like this one, which in this case, for example, include uh, the black box tools, which is our own implementation for forensics uh, data recording. We can build uh, setups that connect the attacker and the subject in not networks, surround them with VPNs, VXLANs, lots of different networking technologies that simulate real and realistic scenarios. We can even go very, very, um, well, not complex, but more elaborated and build things that uh, get uh, reasonably close to uh, some of the study cases we are working with with clients in, in real industries. Uh, let me share with you one of the use cases we recently uh, put together in actually a matter of a few weeks. We built this thing that you will see in about two weeks. So if we did it in two weeks, malicious attackers can certainly do it. Plus the technical complexity of building this up is really not high. And I'm, I'm happy um, or unhappy, I don't know what I must say, to present likely and as far as we know, the first instance of robot ransomware applied on an industrial robot. And I'm gonna switch, apologies for this. We had to split things up to the first video. Oh, there we go. That's it. That's it. So, so this is a video that shows the uh, ransomware um, attack. So what we're seeing over here is how uh, essentially an operator is using the UR robot with the teach pendant. This is happening every day in thousands of places, right? And suddenly, uh, in a purposed or unpurposed manner, a worker connects a stick that unfortunately contains this piece of ransomware, right? And what's gonna happen is gonna be real fun, uh, which is essentially that the robot, by simply connecting this, is gonna get stopped, where essentially, and I'm gonna stop here, actually, so that we all can appreciate it. It's okay. Um, so we stop the robot, we encrypt the file system and all of the tasks, we disable safety, and furthermore, we ask for a Christmas present. So this is surprisingly, and as I pointed out, something we cooked in a really, really short term. Of course, this is not gonna get into the public ever, uh, but the fact that we managed to do this so easily means that there's lots of work to do. 
on our end, and also means that uh, many, many more complex features attacks could be essentially enabled, things such as uh, disabling certain aspects that uh, essentially conflict with safety, things such as uh, iteratively uh, making a particular brand look worse than they are actually. Um, and uh, as complex and as bad as your imagination ca can get. I'm gonna get back to the slides are this one, I think. Okay, so that's uh, Robert Ransomware. Um, let me actually get you a bit on context of what this means. Uh, we performed, as I said, this in a reasonably short time, and we went from five public vulnerabilities that we found for the, U for the UR3 robot, five that were published in 2000, I think 16, 17, by IOActive, a collaborator we've worked in the past, a company doing security. Uh, these five, as I said, are zero days, they haven't been patched, uh, no reaction has happened for a year. We went from five to more than 300, and by the way, we are still counting. 300 vulnerabilities. We really, really need to react. I think a previous speaker said that we're trying to scare people here. Well, <laughs> the situation is scary. The situation is really, really scary. But what can people do it's, time, it's time to react on this now. And furthermore, point is that um, there are opportunities right now. There are several companies, uh, us being one of them, trying to help uh, a variety of different, uh, as I said, manufacturers and users. Um, so if I am one of those, what can I do? Well, the first two advices that we have is a threat model. That means understand your attack surface, understand your attack vectors. You should really do that. Hopefully you do it before you start designing or building a robot, but if not, you can also do it afterwards. It's, not, it's never too late. The second one is once you understand your threat landscape, pen test. Do penetration testing, exactly what we did and what I'm showing here. It is not too late in robotics and we certainly have time. Hopefully that's something Michael can catch up with. Do not panic, <laughs> Elias Robotics is here to help. So it is our pleasure to introduce you our defensive products. Some of you may know us because of our forensics and traceability-oriented black box, which Victor was mentioning before. But today, it is my pleasure to introduce you RIS, the robot immune system. This is a security monitoring software that integrates perfectly with each of your robots. In this case, what we are presenting here is the solution that you are is requiring. So we're basically offering a hardening and a mitigation on top of very well-known vulnerabilities in universal robots that provides also an alert and preventing system. So it becomes fully integrated with your UR teach pendant so the operator is able to see live what the status of the robot is, what the actual threat landscape looks like, and receive in real time alerts and notifications. So we can do several things with our RIS. In, in this case, you have a, a button here that shows the overall status, and is, it becomes red when, when there's a danger or an alert coming, and you can receive a pop-up of the alerts um, just when you press on information, and you can receive these kind of alerts anytime when you are operating the system. So you get this insight on the actual security status if some attacker is trying to exploit vulnerabilities in your UR. So it is our pleasure also to show a live video of this. I uh, will have to switch to video to MP4. So again, uh, we took the role of the attacker to POC to attacks. In this case, the first attack that you will see is using the network attack vector. So the hacker is able to connect to the robot um, and just by launching some malicious commands, the robot is left like a pretty good paperweight. So the system will reboot and then we'll try a second attack, which is basically Exploiting a physical attack vector again, 
So this is very similar attack to a Kerbelch. In this case, the ransomware you just seen, when we basically, again, leave the UR3 as a really nice statue that you can keep for the posterity. So this is the way that you install RIS. It's as simple as plug and play, and it immediately acts and, uh, and patches some security vulnerabilities, harder than some others, and enables this monitoring system within your robot. So you see there, we fix vulnerabilities, then you, we provide a UR cap that the robot end user is able to manipulate, is able to notify pop-ups in real time. Um, it's, it's very easy to use, and with RIS, the attacks look like this. So the hacker is trying a really nice script, and we get a warning signal. A dangerous action has been performed. We get a notification of this. After that, we solve it, and then we try the second attack, the very same, the physical attack vector. And in this case, we're trying to exploit a vulnerability that would render the system unuseless. In this case, we prevent it immediately. So we get the malicious threat prevented message, and the operator, again, is able to resolve and to go back to normal operation. This is ensuring full availability of the robotic system. Availability is critical in industrial domains. Sorry. Thank you, Victor. So this risk adds immediate value on top of universal robots in this case, which is a very uh, particular vendor in the landscape, but we've been in, com in conversation with some other vendors out there. And uh, I have to say that the security landscape that we've seen on the manufacturer side doesn't look very promising. So this was the main motivation for our robot security survey. In essence, the robot security survey wanted to assess the whole value chain in robotics for the security concerns. And this happened uh, because we constantly received inputs from the manufacturers from, let's, let's say, three categories. We had the security aware players that are the fewer, I have to say. Then we have the security agnostics that immediately refer back to some uh, other things, such as, I don't know sec what security means, such as safety or some other weird, let's say, um, answers. And then we have the knowingly uh, players that do not care at all about security and directly blame it to the end user. This is uh, summarized in some distinguished robot manufacturer quotes that we would like to share with you. So, for example, uh, when inquired about security, the, um, they refer immediately to the safety pitch. Some of the really weird claims on the agnostic side that they say that uh, basically uh, cybersecurity flaws greatly facilitate system integration. And uh, some very odd claims as well that uh, just uh, attribute these uh, fixing or mitigating capabilities to the end user. So vulnerabilities are up to the end user in some, um, in some uh, manufacturer's opinion. And just uh, some extra claims that uh, um, advocate for evitating connecting your robot. So this is the main mitigation strategy. Isolate it as much as you can. Um, some of the claims include the fact that um, well, yeah, it noted, but three months later, it cannot be fixed. We couldn't fix it. We need extra assistance. Well, our conclusion then is that the cybersecurity is something that the robot user needs to, to care about. If the robot user is malicious, then we say that cybersecurity is up to the hacker. So that's why we performed this robot security survey Elias Robotics, together with John M. Research, Bernard Dever sitting today in the audience. Um, thanks very much, by the way, some community members that helped circulate this these robot security survey, Thilo in particular. So the overall objective is to depict accurately the global security landscape in robotics. So for that, we wanted to assess the concerns of the rest of the value chain. We knew a little bit about the manufacturers. What about the rest of the players? What about the end user? So that's why we structured the, stru the survey as follows. We ask some sort of general questions, and we dive then into usage and cybersecurity and standardization items. 
for the purpose of this talk, I will be introducing some of the main conclusions that we've drawn out of the data in cybersecurity. So at the time of writing, we had uh, 43 responses um, with very different backgrounds and profiles. So we had some robot manufacturers, university respondents, end users, software component manufacturers, integration, um, all kind of uh, backgrounds in, in there from the industry and with very different positions. So we have uh, the most of them coming from R&D and software engineering phase, but we also have some management positions such as CTOs and CEOs, and not that technical profile such as sales and marketing. So this is some of the observations that we've drawn out of this uh, survey. So when we asked the respondents if they had identified vulnerabilities in the robots, 51% of them said yes. They had identified cyber weaknesses in the robots. Note that some of these profiles were not technical at all. But the good news is that only 9% have witnessed a cyber attack. So this is good news. Cybersecurity breaches are not yet mainstream. We are at the moment of taking action. Now, when we inquired these players about the actual uh, vulnerabilities that they observed, they were all coincidentally mentioning the exposed network services at the main uh, point of, pit of potential vulnerabilities, then potential physical attacks, and issues in proprietary firmware, in this case, were coming third. Now, um, when we asked respondents about their fears when it came to a cyber attack, they feared the most uh, intellectual property rights stealing or industrial property rights stealing. The second, safety violations were a concern. Now, when we asked about the likelihood of, the, uh, of these outcomes to be happening, the safety violation came first and the data loss came second, which is somehow intriguing and this, the mentality that sec security indeed is a prerequisite for this safety. Now, when we ask about the malicious actors to be performing these attacks, uh, hackers came first, obviously, but second, unintentional employees came. So this is employees not knowingly and knowingly performing some, not, not always cyber attacks, but maybe misuse. Th third, sorry. Third, were intentional employees, insiders, that were trying to manipulate these robots from the inside, introducing micro defects or others. Now, security perception has gained relevance. Eight out of ten was the rating that respondents were attributing, whereas the actual perception of robot protected as an endpoint was 2.2 out of 10. And this varies when we unstack all the analysis with all the players in the value chain. So large enterprises have, let's say, a higher consideration for robots protected as an endpoint when it goes down back to universities. Uh, when we ask about security relevance, the, there's a similar curve with an RTOs performing lower, but overall uh, university respondents attribute the highest score to security relevance. What, what happens when it comes to economics? So, it is important to know the economic side of security. Security is a process, not a product. You have to invest on it all the way. 73% of the respondents were open to invest. 26% have actually invested. There's a massive gap. When we asked about the, the, the fact that uh, they thought that they had invested enough, we get the same figure, 73% thought that they had not invested enough. Again, um, the survey is still on. Uh, ping me later if you wish to participate. I can, I can provide you a pointer. Um, we are still gathering data. We'd love to gather some more data of all the, the players and to, to express some of your concerns or not on, on top of security. But this is a callback for action. It's not too late. Roger said it before, is day one for robotics. We should take action now, and this is now the, the, very, the very down of robotics. Let's take the lessons that 
were not learned from other industries in IT. This is time to raise hands and to, to dive into all the security process. Security by obscurity does not work. Security needs to be built since the very beginning in the life cycle. Let's do that now. We are here to help. Elias Robotics is your robot cybersecurity partner, and we are committed to eliminate zero days in robotics. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you for the talk.